you know, you couldn't <laughs> dial it back. That's why I didn't ask you for the past half an hour. <laughs> How do we know who's watching? Do we know? We're going to find out in a couple minutes because the messages will start going um, on here when people start seeing that we're live. There we go. And I'm doing a watch party so that everybody can see you. Um, Vicky's there. Vicky's here. I see Vicky. And let's see. So anyway, uh, I haven't seen you since the beginning of February when we were in New Hampshire and it was about two degrees below zero. Was it that cold? I don't remember. <laughs> sure. It was well, cold. Do you, do you, you know, remember when Mickey was doing the Beatles tribute show in New Hampshire? <laughs> yes, I remember that. <laughs> and he was asking why anybody lives that way because it was so damn cold out there. Well, he says that when he comes to Connecticut in the middle of the summer. Yeah, he, he is interesting. <laughs> um, but I've missed you so much. I know it's got to be hard not seeing my happy face all the time. Yeah, it's horrible. I know, I know. So how have you been during this pandemic? Are you happy with the decision that you made with your family? <laughs> you mean, am I happy with my wife and job? <laughs> yes, I'm very happy. <laughs> Heck of a question. Yes, I, I, yes, I'm happy to be home with my wife and child, yes. You know, I'm not hating it as much as I should. I, I I feel like I should be like ready to climb the walls, but I'm actually I'm fine. How about you? Like, do you, are you okay on on this little break? Yes and no. I have my 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 times. I I take a daily sanity drive. I just get in the car and drive around town for like a half hour. Do you join and but like beep in front of like all the houses and join the parades and stuff for no, the people's do birthdays? No. You know what we could do? We could put you on the back of a truck with drums and we could just like have you doing wipeout through the streets of Connecticut. Yeah, perfect. Because my neighbors don't hate me enough as it is. That's great. <laughs> Thanks, Jody. <laughs> so I, I, I want to actually talk to you because I don't know how many people realize um, that you actually – grew up a monkeys fan just like me we're not too much different in age but you you also were a monkeys fan second yes. generation yep how did you become i mean before you worked for them how did you be how did you get into the monkeys um well as a kid uh i have the fortune of having an uncle who is a record collector and taught me all about the wonders of record collecting and through him, I was able to get just a wide variety of records. And a couple of them were the monkeys. The first one was more of the monkeys. Um, so add that to the fact that they were on a channel out of Boston called Channel 56 in the afternoon. And uh, I just watched them and became fans of them through that. So now, my cousins and I. Did you have a favorite monkey from the television show? Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. Do you work for him? Yes. <laughs> yes. Mickey was my favorite monkey growing up. Yes. Because were were you always into drumming? Like, were you, is that the only instrument you played? No. What else? Um, well, I I play. Well, I went to school for music, so I can play pretty much all the instruments up to a junior high level. Um, though I probably couldn't pick up a trumpet and make a sound out of it now, but at one time I could. Uh, but I play all the percussion instruments. I play guitar, I play bass, I play accordion, I play piano. Um, I You played xylophone, which I thought was pretty interesting. Yep. Well, that's one of the percussion instruments. So. Um, how difficult is, is the music? I don't know anything about reading music. What exactly is it different reading music for percussion for the xylophone and drums? Like, how does that work? Yeah, well, you have melodic percussion, which is uh, xylophone, marimba, vibraphone, uh, timpani. Um, anything that you can play a melody on is a melodic instrument. And those have notes, just like everything else. So you're reading actual music like you would for piano or guitar or saxophone or flute. 
Then you have the non-melodic instruments, which are drums and anything that makes sound. And those are written in, uh, in a notated form, but it's not like, you know, C, D, E, F, G, A. It's notated by symbols and uh, like, so like a hitting a hi-hat, which is the, the two symbols on, on my side, those are indicated by X's instead of dots on the notes. And on the staff, each drum has its specific, uh, so I, I'll show you, I will, I will show you. Um, you did try to teach me once to do drums, but then it was during rehearsal and I think we were annoying people. Yeah. Um, I was. So this is, this is snare drum music. So it's just rhythms written out on one specific line and that's all snare drum music. So that's, you, you just play the rhythm on the drum. Um, drum set music. All right, here's something I'm working on with a student. So this is drum, this is drum set music. So each, so the bottom notes here are the bass drum. The next note up is snare drum and those X's up above are the hi-hat. So you can actually read that the same way that you read a book? Yes. Wow, looks like Greek to me. Ah, it's easy. Like, like it 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 does. So when you when you were going to school, did you want to be a musician? Like, was that your backup plan, or was there that a backup was my plan? plan. <laughs> I didn't have a backup plan. Well, I did, but because my parents wanted me to have a backup plan, so I wanted to go to a conservatory and study music and come out with a performance degree. And my parents wouldn't let me go to a conservatory. They said I had to have a liberal arts background so that I could fall back on teaching if it didn't work out in performing. And I get that. I totally get that. So I went to college to be a music teacher. But what happened was I skipped all my education classes to practice. So I switched my major to performance. So I grad I actually graduated with two degrees. I have a Bachelor of Music in Performance and a Bachelor of Arts in Music Composition. And, you know, I guess at this point, your mom could be saying, we told you so, because during the <laughs> pandemic, <laughs> you're teaching. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we told you, Rich. Yeah. So let me ask you, so um, you did you ever play in any other bands besides the Monkees? Like, how did all of that happen? The Monkees, or how did I start? How did, like, where you graduated, and then where did you go from there? Okay, well, while I was in college, I was in a band called the Maggies. And we had like a top 10 college radio hit. So we did some touring in New York and New England area. And then after college, um, I started playing wherever I could. Uh, and somehow I got hooked up into the symphony scene in Connecticut. And, there's, and Connecticut's a great place to be an independent musician because there's a lot, of, a lot of opportunities. But you have to do it all. You can't just be like, I'm going to play rock and that's it. Cause then you're going to be in, you know, Bobby's midnight bar every weekend. So I was employed by symphonies. I was employed by theaters as employed by anybody who needed a percussionist. I would basically say yes to the gig. I erased the word no from my vocabulary. So anybody who called said, we have a gig for you. There we go. So that's what I did. Uh, that. So then right. how, so you said yes to everything. And then yes. one day you got a call to what, go on Broadway? Uh, that came much later. So oh. I played in, in like local bands. I played in local symphonies. I played with the Bridgeport Symphony, the Meriden Symphony, the Wallingford Symphony. Some of these don't even exist anymore. Um, uh, the Greenwich Symphony. Some of these I still play and I still play in Bridgeport Symphony and sometimes in Greenwich Symphony. Um, but then I started playing in theater theaters as well. There's a lot of regional theater. There's a lot of um, uh, local theater. There's a lot of high school theater. So I started doing all that. And I started subbing at a place called the Goodspeed Opera House. Now that's going to come into play a little later. So somewhere along that line, I hooked up with a guy named Greg Piccolo. And Greg Piccolo is kind of like a blues legend. He started a group called Roomful of Blues with Duke Robillard 
way, way back in the day. And in the 70s, they 70s and 80s, they backed up everybody. They played with uh, Pat Benatar, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Uh, they were the original backup band for the Blues Brothers and, you know, all this other stuff. And Greg went out solo on his own in the early 90s. So in 2001, I went on tour with Greg and I was with him on and off for five or six years. And then in, let's see, God, I'm too old, I can't remember things. Um, then somewhere along the line, uh, I worked for Yale Rep, which ended up becoming my favorite gig. Uh, I did a production of A Comedy of Errors. And then I teamed up with my friend, Anthony DeQuattro. We put together a percussion duo. And then from that, I got hired to be a sub at Good Speed production of Pippin. So I had been a sub at Goodspeed before, but that would be like literally, you know, one or two shows every performance, every show that came through. But for Pippin, uh, Sal Raniello, who was the house drummer, needed somebody to split the book with them, which meant I was playing half the shows as opposed to just coming in once a week or once every other week. And so what happened was I had to learn the book for half the shows. And the first show I subbed on, uh, during the intermission, not even at the end of the show, uh, the music director pulled me aside and said, we're taking this on the road for four months. Do you want to go? Cause we want you. And I said, yes. Now the person playing King Charlemagne in that production was Mickey Dolenz. Was that the first time you ever I lost you? I can't hear you. You can't hear me. <laughs> I can't hear you. Okay. That was the best Jody encounter ever. <laughs> Can you hear that? You really can't hear me? I can't hear you. What do I have to do? Hang up and click it again. Call Dis you? No, I'm no. On the phone. Go. I'm going to text you. <laughs> you want me to reboot? Yes, yes. Okay. That's all you got to do. Okay. So let me give me a second. Go ahead. We're not going anywhere. This is the good part about quarantine. So, um, you know, technical issues. We're having bad weather again. So Rich now is playing at the Good Speed Theater. He's coming back again. Ready? See, I didn't even get a chance to to give my synopsis. Three. Two, can you hear me? We are. I can, can you hear, hear me you now? now? Oh, that's too bad. Oh, I'm sorry. So, okay. So is that the first time that you ever met Mickey? No. I had met him uh, several times before that, most notably in 1997 when Cream Corn opened for the Monkees. What? Yeah. Wait, so, I've never heard this story. Um, you haven't heard this story? No, I have not. So in 1997, they were doing their tour behind uh, Just Us. And uh, it was Peter, Mickey, and Davey. And the last show of that tour was at the Palace Theater in New Haven. And Cream Corn was the opening act. Oh, my God. I had no idea. Yeah. So, yeah. So we got to see the insides and outs of the monkeys that day. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good job. That's impressive. Yeah. Wow. So, okay. So then you... I didn't. That's really cool. And you're still with cream corn. So that's yeah. happening years later. Yeah. Um, okay. So then you see Mickey again and now you're going on tour. Didn't you just get married? Like, hadn't you just gotten married? Uh, it was, a, it was, um, I got married in 2005. Pippin was 2006. What's it? I mean, it's gotta be hard going on tour for four months when you. Yeah, are, that, that, that was, not terrible because uh, we didn't have a child yet. So uh, Tracy was able to come out and visit me a bunch of times on that tour, which was nice. How many cities did you go to? Not many. Um, Were you in like, Philadelphia? We did play. Did we play Philadelphia? Because I, I saw Pippin in Philadelphia. Well, then we played Philadelphia. Yes. I know we played Hershey. Oh, Philadelphia was the last show of the, the, the last city of the tour. Yeah. I was there. I didn't even know you guys at the time. There you go. It, I, I, it was a weird show to me. Like it wasn't, 
you know, I guess I really didn't know what I was expecting because I'm used to, you know, I had seen Mickey in his solo shows. Mm -hmm. and this was the first time I ever saw him in a stage performance. So it was, it was a little weird making that transition, um, seeing him in, in that kind of a role. So where would you have been like underneath in the orchestra pit? Yep. And in fact, that was, it was a weird show all around. I, I loved the show. And what's really interesting is when I got the call from Sal, I immediately went, oh, because as an independent musician, you play Pippin constantly You're because high schools do it all the time, or at least they used to. And it's one of those shows that you're just like, ah, oh, I got to play Pippin again. But this was a new orchestration. It was really, really cool. And the whole thing about that show was that was supposed to be the revival that went to Broadway. And that was totally fully backed by uh, the original, you know, people who put Pippin together. And um, like Stephen Schwartz was totally behind that production. And that was supposed to go to Broadway. What happened was we were spending six weeks in Toronto, Canada. And when we got to Toronto, it got panned bad, like they trashed it. And at that point, all hopes of Broadway went snip. I thought the Canadians were supposed to be nice. Uh. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so, so then that ends. Yes. And then how did you develop a relationship with Mickey that brought you to work with him? Well, I became really close with Mickey over the tour. So we were the guys that went out every night looking for live music after the show. He was voracious to find live music every night. So we would go after the show, we would find a club. Sometimes it was easy to find, sometimes it wasn't. In Toronto, it was really cool because we found this great place to go and hear this girl Janice Hagen sing almost every night, which was awesome. Um, we, we, uh, where did we go in, was it Philly? Yeah, Philly, there was a great jazz club we went to. Uh, but then there were places like Hershey, Pennsylvania, you know, right <laughs> before Christmas where there was nothing open. Yeah, uh, like farm but state. we would, but we got, we just started hanging out and going from place to place together. How about that? So yeah. then, well then, okay, so then you separate, you go your way, he goes his way. How did you wind up getting the job with him or with the monkeys? Like, how did that happen? Okay, well, after that, well, I'll, let's back up a little bit. So when we were in Toronto, we did a benefit show. So when you're in theater, you have an off night. You play eight shows a week, but one night you're, you're, the theater's dark. And it's usually Monday. So when we were in Toronto, it was us and the touring production of Wicked. And we got together one Monday night and did a benefit show for Broadway Cares, Equity Fights AIDS. And it was at uh, some bar in the um, on Church Street, which is the gay district, on a Monday night. And everybody from each cast got to get up and, and do something. Now, originally, I didn't want to be a part of it because I had tickets to see Tenacious D at the Maple Leaf Gardens that night. Me and, and the bass player and the guitar player. And... I was like, ah, oh, I really want to be a part of that, but I, I really want to see Tenacious D. I spent my money on that. And then we found out Mickey was playing, and I was like, okay, I've got to, I've got to play Monkey songs with Mickey Dolenz. So we had a rehearsal for that, and he tells this story all the time. We had a rehearsal before we did the show, and he came into the rehearsal, and he said, uh, all right, we're going to do some Monkey songs. Uh, who knows what? And he asked the keyboard player, what songs do you know? And he said, well, I know I'm a believer and Daydream Believer. Guitar player said, I know Last Train to Clarksville. And he got to me and I said, I know all of them. <laughs> and he said, no, you don't. I said, I know all of them. So he, this is where our stories change a little bit. He says he started playing Going Down and I joined him. That didn't happen. But uh, we'll say it did for the sake of, of Mickey's oh, Mickey, story. <laughs> so, um, it's his so, band. It's his show. <laughs> right. So we ran through a couple songs. And then when we were doing sound check that day at the club, he just randomly started playing Circle Sky. And I joined him. And he turned around and said, how the hell did you know that song? And I said, I told you I know every Monkey song. So from that point on, I kind of bugged him. 
I said, well, who's your drummer? He's like, Sandy Gennaro. I'm like, okay, that's, that's fine. I can't touch Sandy. I, I'm a big fan of Sandy's. I know that. Um, but he said, yeah, I'll call you. We'll do something. And we ended up doing a Rockers on Broadway together in New York after that. But right after that, I got asked to do Avenue Q on Broadway. Because Is that a the lot. big puppets? Yes. That's the, the Sesame Street for adults, as they say. It's and, a um, black screen, right? And like the puppets, you could see them, but you can't see the people, right? Like the people. No, are you can totally backwards. see the people. Yeah. Oh, okay. It, it's it's a it's a regular set of you know buildings in New York City on Avenue Q, um, and the people come out holding the puppets, and they sing and they swear and they have sex. All good, good stuff. But anyway, a lot of the people involved in Pippin were involved in Q. And one of the orchestrators of Pippin was Michael Kreuter, who was the drummer for Avenue Q. So he's like, what are you doing when Pippin tours over? I said, I'm going back home to nothing. And he said, well, why don't you come in and learn Q and you, you can sub for me? So I played on Broadway for five months on Q. And then it went on uh, its first national tour. And they asked me to be the drummer. And I was on it for two years. For two years, this yeah. job that wasn't supposed to last very long lasted two years. Uh, it, it was never not supposed to last long. Oh, but that seems like a long time. It is a long time. Wow. <laughs> okay, so then you're doing Avenue Q, and then yeah. what happens? Well, uh, Mickey kind of kept calling me up and wanted to know what I was doing. And I said, well, I'm still doing Avenue Q. And when I was in LA, I hung out with Mickey. He's like, well, when are, you, when are you done with this? I said, well, I'm contracted for two years. So what happened was I actually got an offer to do a, a brand new show at the Good Speed right after Avenue Q, the, the Q tour. So I did that. And then I got a call from Mickey. Well, it was while I was doing that, that I got the call from Mickey and he said, uh, you know, I've got some dates. I'm, I'm going to need you. So I said, OK. So he hooked me up with Wayne Avers. We talked through some things. And my first gig was Fourth uh, of July weekend, 2010 in Maine. And that was my first gig. And it was like everything else I had been doing, like on Broadway and everything else. There's no rehearsal. It's trial by fire. You go in, you play the gig. And uh, at the end of the show, he took me out to dinner and said, you're hired, buddy. You're my drummer. <laughs> And that's that's, that's Isn't it funny how we all go into the Mickey voice. <laughs> I love doing Mickey. I love his voice. So, so you never turned back from then, right? No. And then um, they went out in 2011 with Mickey, Peter, and Davy, uh, but that was Davy's band. And you know, I was kind of hoping I'd be on it, but I was the new guy, so I didn't have any say in anything. And I was like, cool. I went to the show. I saw it. And then the following year when Mickey, Mike, and Peter went out, um, that's when Mickey's band got to be the backing band. Tell me, so you actually never performed with Davey then? No, I hung that's out with Davey once. Hmm? Yeah, I only hung out with Davey once. I met him a bunch of times, but I only hung out with him once at his last show at uh, the Wolf's Den at Mohegan Sun. Um, we all hung out together afterwards. What was it like for you? Because obviously, I mean, we joke around and make fun of each other all the time, but what was it like for you when, did you ever have, like with me, I had a, a moment where I stopped and I was like, I cannot believe like I'm here. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have that moment where you were like, where am I? How did this happen type of thing? Um, no. I never, I never questioned it. I'm, I was thrilled to death to get the call and I was super excited to get the monkeys call. Um, but I never questioned it. I've, ne I've never, you know, I still, every time we go out, I still feel amazed that I have this opportunity and I go out of my way to thank everybody involved. I always say thank you to Mickey. What? So you started playing with Mickey and then when, what was it like, when you first met Nez, because I try to explain that I never ever imagined I'd ever have the opportunity to meet to meet him. Right. Did you feel that way too? Like this was an enigma that you never 
imagined that you would be seeing in person, let alone playing with? Yeah, that was a that was a weird thing being told that we were going out with Nesmith. Um, and for a while, it was on the table that all four of them were going to go out, obviously, before Davey passed. Yeah. And I just assumed, well, I'm not going to be part of that. That's going to be Davey's band again or maybe somebody else entirely. Right. Um, but then ultimately, Davey passed and they didn't get to do that. And that's when we came on board. And I was that was really mind blowing for me. But it was really weird uh, going into those rehearsals because um, we had our little family of Mickey's band. And then we added Christian onto that. And we had never worked with Christian before. That was our first time meeting Christian. So there was that, you know. Another dynamic that came. Another dynamic that was entered in. Not a negative dynamic by any means. We were all very welcoming to Christian and we were all excited to, to work together. Every Everybody in in our little family, our little band, are, are all very welcoming to everybody. We all have a big love for everybody. And I say family because it really is a family. And just like every other family, there's going to be times when you're ticked off at them. But um, so we added that into the mix and we rehearsed just as a band for a couple of days. And then the guys came in and it was a very, um, I don't want to say tense because that's not the proper word, but it was very, um, we were all very timid and walking on eggshells because we knew how to react to Mickey and we knew how we could be with Mickey. We didn't know how we could be with Nez. Um, and Christian was kind of like, he knew how he could be with Nez, but not with Mickey. So there was that weird feeling in the room. And, and again, I don't want to say the word tense because there wasn't tension, but there was. It wasn't a bad tension. No, just, I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about. That some, like you, you have, you almost want to be on your best behavior because you don't, you don't know how, you don't know them. They're, they're new to the fact. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Um, but once we started working together and once we started playing, then that familiarity came into to play. Um, now, add to that, in addition to me getting comfortable with that, I have to teach my boss all of his drum parts that he had learned the year before with Felipe Torres <laughs> teaching him. But somewhere along the line needed to be taught again. Oh, that's and, cool, because Mickey played drums again on yeah, the tour. Yeah, so Mickey playing drums. So I actually had to teach him the drum parts. And um, the great thing about Andrew Sandoval putting these shows together is that he got rid of all of the, the 80s and 90s, you know, yeah, Las Vegas the arrangement. Yeah, with the brass section and this and that, and brought everything back to the original recordings. And we all worked very, very hard to get to that original recordings. So when I say I had to teach Mickey his parts, I had to teach him the parts that he played or that war played on the original recordings, because up to then he was just going with the flow, playing whatever. So I had to make sure that he knew the original parts just as much as I knew the original parts. You know, you probably don't even realize it, but so many people after Davey had passed away, they were furious with Nez because they had announced the tour with Mike and Mickey and Peter and accusing Nez of not wanting to tour with Davey, waiting for Davey to die. Or, you know, now is when he's deciding to tour because Davey's not there anymore. When the truth of the matter is, like you pointed out, there was already a conversation about the four of them that they were potentially going right. to tour. What happened with Davey was unexpected, of course, right. but that's what a lot of people had had been um, trying to say was the case, and that wasn't the case. But no. it was fun controversy, you know? Well, that was during that era when everybody was going out and doing this entire album. We're going to do this album in its an entirety. And their, well, Andrew's dream was to have them do the Headquarters album in its entirety as the four of them. Oh, my God. Can you imagine? So, I mean, we kind of did that in 2012. I mean, yeah. obviously, we do Band 6 and... Um, you know, Zilch. We did do Zilch on stage at the Greek theater that year, if I'm not mistaken. It was a it was a total fluke. They just started doing it in the middle of the show. That might have been the year they did that. One That's of the years. Amazing. And now I don't think they ever did Mr. Webster. No, we didn't do Mr. Webster. And uh 
there's another one on there that we ended up doing later on the 50th anniversary tour, but not that that year. Um, I'll spend my life with you. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I so then okay. No, what about the the Peter dynamic? Because you didn't mention anything. Like now we've got Nez coming in, who was a little, you know, that was that was right. different different to get used to. But what about with Peter? I mean, what was your first interaction with him like? Well, Peter, um, we had done a show with Peter prior to this. My second gig, either my second or third gig was in uh, Sacramento. It was this whole like rock and roll fantasy camp with Mickey. And I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And uh, at the end of that was a big concert that featured uh, Mickey. Um, uh, I can't think of his name. Jerry Corbetta from Sugarloaf. Mark Lindsay. Peter was on it. Um, and who else was on it? There was somebody else. Oh, Andrew Gold. That was Andrew Gold's oh last. Oh, my God. Okay. Uh, and so we got to work with Peter on that. And Wayne obviously had worked with Peter. Um, out of all of us, Wayne was the only one that had worked with all of the monkeys. Dave worked with them, but he wasn't part of the band when when they did the 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 four guys in England, the Just Us tour. He was working on the tour. I think he was a roadie and then did merch and stuff, but he actually wasn't playing in the band. Um, so Wayne had been part of that. John had worked with Peter because Peter had played with them before I came into the scene. And all those guys had, had worked with Peter beforehand. So that was my first interaction with Peter. And I actually met him on the plane and I told him who I was. And he was like, Oh, okay, good, good, good. We're going to, we're going to do great. You can play a blue shuffle. And I said, yes, I, you know, I know how to play a blue shuffle. So, how many uh, times did Peter, did people ask you if you're Peter's son? A million times. People would come up to me and say, and, and ask me about, about Peter's son. And I was like, I don't think he's here. I don't even, I don't. And they would go, no, the drummer. And I would say, they're not even related. No. No, no, the drummer is his son. And I'm like, did I miss something? <laughs> that happened. That happened. Well, growing up, I was the kid that looked like Peter Tork. And uh, one of my English teachers made fun of me one time because uh, for the 1986 tour, they each had their own T-shirt. I'm sure you know about that. I might and, have one. <laughs> and there's one of Peter. And I wore that to school one day. <laughs> and my English teacher ragged on me and said, look at this guy. He comes into sh to school wearing a shirt with his own picture on it. What's up with that? <laughs> but I got that growing up. Um, then once I started playing with Mickey, well, on the Pippin tour, he had just put out Gacky Two Feet, his children's book. And he would do book signings. And I'd go with him to the bookstores just so I had something to do during the day. And uh, I would go and all these people would be lined up to meet him. And they'd be like, are you Peter Tork? They actually asked me if I was Peter, not his son, Peter. And I said, well, I appreciate that, but you know, I'm 30 years old. <laughs> if I look like I'm older than that, I got trouble. <laughs> I don't know why people automatically think that we're related to these people. I don't know. Uh, so many people, I've had people call me Donna. I've had people tell me that they love my husband. And I, I'm like, my husband and I at first I didn't realize they were not talking about John <laughs> they like they're telling me about my husband that's on the stage and I'm like that's not my husband I just work for him I'm a fan like you are oh my god it's fun that's it's fun I mean I I get it I got the same hair that's the thing Although you, you have the exact same the exact same hair and then standing next to Mickey from behind you can kind of understand like where I the get it. will come I in. Get it. Even as far as, even as recently as the New Hampshire show, there were all these people lined up to buy merch and get stuff signed by Mickey. And I was looking for my niece and I walked through the line and these two women go, we, we really loved your father. And I didn't even think about it. And I said, how'd you know my dad? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, you know, Peter. And I'm like, oh, that's not my dad. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god one, one, one time 2012 2013 one of those years we were in uh st louis 
and the buses were parked in the parking lot and there was a chain link fence and all the fans were lined up against the, the fence. And I got off the bus to go into the theater and I heard a bunch of people go, hi, Ivan. How you doing, Ivan? I said, great. How are you? <laughs> all right. Best fan moment that you've witnessed in all your years playing with them. God, that's a good question. Best fan moment. Something that uh, that you can't make up. There's some ones that I don't want to say. Oh no, we don't. <laughs> I believe there's lawsuits protecting. <laughs> Okay, my first gig with Mickey, or it's July weekend, 2010. We're in Maine. Now I'm the shy, quiet kid. I'm the new guy on the block. And even ask Wayne, like I came in, I did the sound check. I went back up to my room. I came in, I did the show. I went back up to my room and Dave actually texted me and said, come on down and hang out. We hang out after the show. You're kind of still like that, you know. <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm anti-social. <laughs> so, uh, I come down and there is uh, a woman who is a little inebriated at the bar and denturely challenged. <laughs> and she's coming over us and hugging every one of us and screaming on the top of her lungs, welcome to Maine. So that's a good one. <laughs> We, no offense to the woman if she's watching. We were the um when we were in oh my god, it wasn't New Hampshire. The day before that we were um oh my god, it might have been not Connecticut. There was one date that we had in between New Hampshire and Connecticut. We were in that really cool hotel. And Mickey and I come late to the bar. And this woman <laughs> This, this lady is, is sitting. She gets up when Mickey comes and and she's like, hi, it's nice to meet you. And, and Mickey says, nice to meet you, darling. This is Jody. She's my um, producer and this and and she does this and we do karaoke. And he's I mean, this woman knew everything about me. And he goes, it's nice to meet you, blah, blah, blah. He goes and sits down and orders a drink. The lady says to me, who's that? <laughs> That's beautiful. She had no idea who it was. I yep. go, it's Mickey Dolan's. She goes, huh? <laughs> she knew who I was. But she didn't know him. That's great. <laughs> Nice. So you, I, guess, I mean, some of these stories are really just so funny. Yeah. Um, so then you start touring with the guys. And um, uh, then I know that um, before Peter passed away, he had done a um, show. And I don't want to screw up the name of it. It was In This Generation, My Life in... The monkeys yeah, and more. So much more. Yes. Um, and I know Peter had asked you to mm -hmm. join him. Uh, what were you, a producer or a handler for I him? I was his road manager for the East Coast leg. For, what? I did not get an opportunity to see that um, show. What, what exactly was that? It was probably the greatest thing Peter ever did, in my humble opinion. Really? So great. He really, he shined like gold in that. It was gorgeous. And what it was, was just him and an acoustic guitar on stage playing and telling stories. Uh, it started out with this student film he was in that I think is on YouTube somewhere. Um, uh, when he was going to UConn, or did he go to UConn? I know his dad taught at UConn, well, whatever college he went to. Um, and it, he was in the student film and we would start with that. And then he'd come out and he'd play, do I have to do this all over again? And there'd be images on the screen provided by Andrew Sandoval. And then he would tell stories from the beginning of his musical life up to that point. And 
it started out, we workshopped it at his house, me, him, and Andrew. And then we brought it to Buffalo. Buffalo was the first stop. And we had to really condense it because that show went on. It, it was almost three and a half hours in Buffalo. Wow. So we had to really work to bring it down. Um, so then from Buffalo, we just did the East Coast. And it was me and him. That was it. Because Andrew was there for Buffalo, but then he left. And it was, you know, like two guys driving across the country in the van, in my minivan, going from stop to stop. And we went down the East Coast and played all these little small clubs. And it was so good. It was the best performing I've seen Peter do ever. He sounded great. His guitar playing was great. His banjo playing was great. It was fun. The one thing um, when I had the opportunity to actually sit down and talk to Peter, he seemed more excited talking about the times when he was a teacher than mm -hmm. when he was performing with the monkeys. Definitely. Um, what what did you get out of what? Were there any stories that you heard um, that a, a regular fan would mm -hmm. be really surprised uh, um, about something you learned about Peter from from his story? Well, Peter was very misunderstood by what a lot that, of people. That mean? So Peter was very shy and very private. And in his own way, did not like to be around crowds. He, he, a little bit of an agoraphobia, not, you know, full blown, but he did have an issue with being near crowds. But at the same time, he loved and appreciated the fans who cared about him, obviously. So when those two things meet, it's like two magnets trying to fight each other. And it would all come out in a weird way. So a lot of, I mean, everybody's got a story about how they've seen Peter explode or got yelled at by Peter or Peter was rude to them. And that wasn't necessarily Peter. That was more him having this inner struggle between really, really wanting to, to reach out and say, thank you so much, but really, really being shy and, and pulling back from that. And when you got to know Peter, I mean, Peter and I were very close, extremely close. And when you got to know Peter, you totally understood that. Um, he was also in a struggle with himself. Uh, you know, he was very, and I relate to this in, in a big way, because I'm the same way. He was very self-deprecating, very like, I don't think I'm good enough. I don't, you know, but pushing himself to be that good. And then wanting to prove to himself that he was good by trying to prove to you that he was that good. So there's that inner struggle that was really going on in Peter. And we really connected over that because I'm like that all the time. I think I'm horrible. I think I suck. So we really bonded over that. When um, when I was observed, he was the first um, celebrity that I ever sat with and like one person would come up and they would say, Oh, I'm so sorry about Davy. What was he like? And this was right after Davy passed away. And then the next person would come up and say, or ask the exact same thing. Then the next person, when there was a little bit of a break, I said to him, how do you, how do you deal with asking and res uh, re responding to the exact same question over and over and over again. And he said he used to have a problem with it that um, I want to say that it was Nesmith that actually had to point out to him years before the person behind that person doesn't know that the person in front of them just asked that question right it's new to them. And so he had to, I guess, learn or, or teach himself how to deal with the public. Um, I'm glad that you point that out, you know, because the, it seems like your personalities were so much alike, um, you, you and Peter, mm -hmm. um, when you played a show um, with Mickey and Peter, 
And Nez, did you find that Peter was harder on himself when he performed with those guys versus performing by himself? Yes. Because he needed to be at a certain level where if he was the solo, he didn't, it, it didn't bother him as much or. Um, I think it's more of trying to hold his own. Um, you know, Peter was always, you know, uh, there are a lot of people who love Peter and Peter is their favorite, but in the grand scheme of things, he was kind of the odd man out. He didn't have a lot of lead vocals. He was always, you know, in the background somewhere contributing so much, but not really out in front like the other three guys. Um, and so I think he really felt like he wasn't in there in the same category, in the same band. So he really pushed himself and was really hard on himself to get there. To, to it's it's weird because I wonder if maybe in retrospect, a, fab, a prefabricated band wasn't really the best choice for a real musician. For, no. you know, for somebody that really wanted to focus on their craft right. to be told what to do from day one, you know, for, I would imagine that that's got to be hard. Um, but yeah, it's what, well, go ahead. What when Peter was telling his stories of his life growing up, mm -hmm. when you first heard these stories or, or anything, is there anything that surprised you about him? that maybe you didn't know? I didn't know that he was uh, against rock and roll as a child. <laughs> so he was brought up in a very artsy family and he was brought up on classical music. And when rock and roll hit, he, he didn't like it. He thought it was horrible. He thought it was banal. He thought it was just, you know, totally boring, three chords, four chords, and you know where those chords are going. Which is funny because a lot of classical Nazis, shall we say, say that all the time. But when you analyze classical music, it's the same thing. I mean, Mozart's pieces are all based on the same three chords that rock and roll are based on. But not to get all intellectual on you and stuff. And the one song that turned him around to popular music was I Want You, I Need You, I Love You by Elvis. That wow. song that turned him on to pop music, because before that, he thought it was all garbage. I mean, that's pretty early in the rock and roll era, but still, before he heard that, he, he thought it was all garbage. How about that? Yeah, and that kind of struck me as funny. I'm surprised because I I know a lot of musicians that don't really take Elvis very seriously. Oh, so, gosh. Elvis is awesome. Don't knock the king. Maria's Latest Flame is my favorite, one of my favorite songs in general. That's the flip side to Little Sister. Now, see, I don't know that much about Elvis. <laughs> so, all right. So you, you driving with Peter and... Um, when Peter passed away, um, I, I know that all of you were very upset in your own way, but did you feel like you spent such a good amount of time with him? Like, was that therapeutic for you in knowing that you had that personal time with him? I guess so. Yeah. I mean, we, we knew it was coming. Yeah. Um, unlike the rest of the public, That's we right. knew what was going on. Um, and I had been in touch with him regularly, texting him regularly. And, and, and I knew it was going to be a matter of a time. I was actually getting uh, my tires rotated and uh, I was in the waiting room and I got a text from John Billings and it said, did you hear about Peter? And I knew exactly what it was. Um, but so we had been expecting it, but you still, even if you're expecting it, it's not that big. I mean, it is a big shock is what I meant to say. Not oh, yeah. that. Yeah. So it was, it was tough, but um, it was funny because Andrew called me that day too. And he said, I know you and I had a special relationship with Peter because of that solo show. Um, and he was right. We did have a special relationship. So yeah, I guess it was kind of therapeutic that I, I had had that. I mean, you had an opportunity that I look at 
the opportunities I had with Mickey and Mike. And I think so many people would give their eye teeth to be in our position, you know, and here you're just driving down the road with yeah. somebody that is on somebody's wall, you know, yeah. like, like mine, like yours many times over. It, it, it. <laughs> <laughs> listen, I saw monkey stuff on your, your walls. I you will show you something extremely cool that I don't show many people. Hang on, right there. Don't move. Okay. Don't move. Don't move. Don't go. Don't go anywhere. Be right back. Rich is going to get his shirt from the third grade with Peter on it and try it on, and it's still going to fit. Is that wig from the Heart and Soul um, video? Is that a what? A wig that's behind your chair. Is that from the Heart and Soul video when Davy dressed up in that? Um, Look at that. Not hang that uh that banana hammock uh tight tiger looking outfit. Okay, this this thing. Yes, that was worn by Molly Tynes, uh, who was a member of the cast of Pippin when we did that uh thing when we did that benefit. Her and Ashley Archmont, who was also in it, came out and sang "What About Love," and they dressed in '80s garb and wore wigs, and that's. Molly's wig. That's awesome. <laughs> okay. So in high school, I entered a contest. And I think it was from Monkey Business Fancy, and I'm not positive, to win an autographed program from Peter and Davy's Australia tour. <laughs> right there. To Rich, keep on drumming. Best of luck, Peter Tour. So then fast forward to, I can't take, I can't show you that because it's hanging on my wall upstairs. Um, we have posters from when we played the Ryman in Nashville. And uh, it says, to Rich, stop following me, Peter Tor. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I don't show this to many people because I know Wayne Avers will just be relentless in mocking me. So... But you still have the Peter Tork t-shirt. No, I don't. I sold that a long time ago. I sold, I, I had every t-shirt you could think of and I sold them all in one big batch on eBay. And then I got a nasty letter from the guy who won them saying, there's all sweat stains on these. You know what you say? These are, this is monkey sweat. I, I said, they said they were used. That is so, so funny. So, I want to ask you, a lot of people don't realize, and, and I was one of them, I really wanted to go and see the show that you guys did with the orchestra in Arizona. Yes. And I wasn't able to go. And you actually did all the arrangements for all the instruments for that. Is that right? No, it's partially right. Are you partially right? <laughs> what, did you, no. what did you do? Because... Truth, I was I was not feeling well. I, I was sick or something. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Dave Alexander, who I just love, out of nowhere, I get a text message and it's a video. And it was a video of underneath the piano because he was hiding the, the camera or on the phone. And he it was Mickey singing as we go along with the orchestra. And I just sat there and I cried. I never heard anything so beautiful. It was beautiful. What, what exactly, how did that happen that you, that you did that? Okay. Um, so what happened was a few years back, Mickey got asked to do a gig with this uh, orchestra in Oregon called the, the Metropolitan American. Orchestra. Yes. It's that album. That came Metropolitan out. Orchestra. That one. And uh, the deal was that he would get to keep the arrangements when they were done. That was part of his payment. And then they would shop those around to various symphonies all over the country. The problem was the arrangements were supposed to be based on the arrangements that we did as Mickey's band. But the person who wrote the symphony arrangements took a few liberties and changed the arrangements so that they were a, a little bit different, not a lot. I mean, you can't really change that much but he changed enough so that it didn't fit with what we did. So Wayne came to me and said, you're the symphony guy. 
can you rearrange these so that they work with us? So I went through all the parts and, and rescored a lot of them. And then I actually wrote my own arrangement of Give Me Some Lovin' and um, Different Drum. And I think there was another one I did too. I can't remember. But anyway, I wrote those arrangements. With uh, I did have some help. Because is that why you changed how Coco does different drum now? Because yes. the last three shows, it was different, yeah. but a bit different, you know? Well, we did it. Uh, that was me taking my liberties. Because <laughs> I originally wrote the arrangement to give me some love just because I thought that was a big tune that needed an orchestra accompaniment. And uh, I did get some help. I can't take full credit for that. I did get some help from my friend, David Chiapetta, who was um, one of the orchestrators on Pippin. He helped me out with that. Because uh, I hadn't orchestrated anything like that since college. And Wayne said, this is great. You know, there's strings on different drum. Can you write an arrangement for that? And I said, sure. So I wrote the arrangement. And then I thought it'd be really, really cool. This is the you know, symphony music geek in me coming out. If that middle section, we did like the record, where it's a harpsichord solo, but I had the woodwinds playing that. And because it would make this like really cool Baroque section. And so I asked Coco, I went to Coco first. I went above Wayne's head. I went to Coco first and I said, if I put this in here, is it going to throw you off? She said, no, I can learn that. So then I went to Wayne. I said, I changed it. So then now the way we do different drum is like the record where it's that breakdown at the harpsichord solo. It was absolutely beautiful. I saw some of the video um, that some of the people in Arizona shot from the one that you did. And what do you think you prefer? Like if you, if you had your dream, would it be doing it with the orchestra or would it be the solo show where it's more rock and roll? Um. I loved playing with the symphony. I thought it was great because I'm a symphonic musician. Uh, it was cool to hear my arrangements coming out of those those instruments. Um, Were you proud of yourself? Did you finally realize that you did really great? Yeah. <laughs> but I'm always thinking I can do better. Like, you know, listen to, I'm like, well, I could have changed that. And I could do that. And I'm still in my head, I'm thinking if we do this again, I'm going to change this and I'm going to do that. Um, but ultimately, I'm doing the same thing in both situations. I play a little bit louder and harder if it's just the solo band, whereas with the symphony, I'm playing a little quieter. Um, so, yeah, I guess it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. I would love to do more of those. We've pitched it to several symphonies. and We've gotten some interest, but with all that's going on right now, who knows what's going to happen. Well, we'll just have everybody. We'll have like twenty people in the Academy of Music, you know, and and perfect. It's on the stage. Perfect. So when I, I have to ask you, because I mean, it had nothing to do with Peter, but I had strategically made it so that I would take my pee break during Auntie Griselda. <laughs> Was there? What is your favorite song to play and your least favorite song to play? Oh, you're going to get me in trouble. Nobody's good at, you think that they, <laughs> they're sitting there going, oh, I know exactly what he's going to say. Um, I don't know. It. I think my favorite song to play is Pleasant Valley. I was, oh, yeah. I was just going to say, there's something about when that song starts that you know that you're in the presence of Mickey Dolan's. Yeah. Me, I mean, I don't get tired of it. Um. As a, as a complete song, I think that's the one I like playing the most. The one I like playing the least. Oh. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna pass on that to uh, protect my job. <laughs> okay, all there, right. I, I, out of there is no song I despise. I yeah, love play. Sure. Ultimately. If I'm playing, I'm happy. And I'll give you a perfect example of that. In Connecticut, I play with uh, some really good friends in a band called The Grateful Friends, which is a combination of The Grateful Dead and Max Creek and all stuff like that. And I hate The Grateful Dead. <laughs> there aren't many musical acts I can say I hate, but The Grateful Dead is one of them. I but 
there with you. But um, in fact, I'll tell you my joke, and I'm going to catch flack for this. When Jerry Garcia died, I said it was the end of an air ache. But um, see, I have to so, be careful because my uncles have gone to like 9,000 Grateful Dead concerts. My best friends are all deadheads. So, but playing in that band is fun because I'm playing with really great musicians who are really nice guys, really great people. And ultimately, I like playing. So even if I'm leaving the house one night and I turn to Tracy and I go, oh, I don't want to play this gig, I'm going to have fun because I enjoy playing. So even if it's a song I don't like, I'm still going to enjoy playing it. The one thing that I noticed about your band, about Mickey's band, yeah. is that I probably have seen the show over 200 times and I do not get sick of it. Because every time I watch you guys differently, like I'll study Wayne, I'll study you, I'll study Dave, I'll study John, and I pay attention. The one thing is that you guys have such a funny camaraderie on the stage. If you're even have, and I mean, to see you guys before the show and after the show, you could be like not feeling well, which you weren't feeling well the last couple of shows that we did. But as soon as you get on the stage, you, if anybody pays attention, you and John, all you do the whole time is make like faces at each other. <laughs> it's a show within a show. And I've asked Mickey on several occasions about the band. And he's like, I love them to show their personality. I, you know, like I encourage them to be funny. And, I, and, the, and you are, you always look like you're enjoying what you do. Even yeah. even under the worst circumstances. All right. So, what's the largest audience you ever played in front of? Oh, geez. Um, with the monkeys or with someone else? Whoever. Um, I don't know. I know I've played. can't remember who I who I play I one Avenue Q place was huge but I think one monkey show we played to it was either a monkey show or a Mickey show that we played to like 10,000 people what was it like playing at Sydney Opera House oh my god that was the most amazing place in the world why uh, well first of all the acoustics are insane whoever built that hall is a genius because it doesn't matter my big fear going into symphony halls with a rock band is that it's just going to be oh because oh, those halls aren't built for amplified groups and i've seen it a million times the bridgeport symphony plays in uh, a beautiful hall called the Klein Auditorium in Bridgeport. And it's built for the symphony. The symphony sounds amazing in it. And for a while they were bringing in live bands like Cheap Trick and the B-52s, all great acts, but the sound was just not as good because you're in this hall that's built for acoustic, not electric. So I was really worried about Sydney Opera House. And from the moment we started playing, I was just amazed by that because it just sounded so good. And I love playing big symphony halls because the first thing I do when we get to sound check is I go up to my drums and I go to the snare drum and I play so quiet. I just go. And if it's a huge hall like um, the Skirmahorn Center in Nashville or the, the symphony hall in, in uh, Seattle, you hear that. It's a like, ting. And that to me is like, this is great. And then we plug in and it becomes. Rah! But at the Sydney Opera House, it wasn't like that at all. It was, they knew their stuff. And I really wanted to go and see the symphony rehearsal before us, but they wouldn't let us in. We had to watch it on TV in the lobby. But uh, that hall was amazing. So that was, that's definitely a highlight of, of my career is playing Sydney Opera House. I'm really hoping that this thing is over soon so we can get back on the road because- You and me both. We're just, I mean, the one thing that Mickey has is that all of us are fans of his. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a unique situation, but all of us really like him. Yeah. 
we, he's, you know, he's the nicest guy on the planet. He really is. Are you at all concerned when you put me to drive him somewhere that I might kidnap him? No. That, we don't think you're that smart. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we get along the way we yeah. do. Um, I wanted to just congratulate you on the new um, CD. Oh, thank also, you. I, I, I'm, I'm, I opened it and I was freaking out. Um, just so excited. And uh, you guys just did a great job. I know Christian spent a long time um, working with that, but when did, did, does it, is it different when you know that you're recording for a live CD? No, I mean, it is. But the way they did this is they didn't really tell us when they were hitting the record button. Oh, you didn't know. We knew that they were recording some of the shows, but we weren't sure which ones. And and it's actually better that way because when so you can be playing the same thing a million times, like I've played Last Train to Clarksville a million times. But if somebody's hitting a record button, that's going to change what's going on in here because all of a sudden I'm like, this is going to be forever. This is on tape and, and any mistake I make is there forever. So you do get tensed up a little, but if you don't know what they're recording and what they're not recording, then you can just goof off and do whatever you do normally. It, I, <laughs> I was just so happy because I like all the songs. All right. This is the last question I'm going to ask you. Okay. If you, being that, you know, all the monkey songs, if you could add one song that Mickey never plays any monkey song to the tour, whichever Mikey, Mickey, Mickey, whatever. What song is your favorite monkey song that they don't play? Um, maybe love is only sleeping. Really? But that's a tough one. Cause we actually did work on that. We did try to put that into the show one year. Um, so maybe if there's one that we've never worked on, I don't know. I would love to do Shorty Blackwell, but I know that's an impossibility. Who uh, wouldn't? Uh, and I do. What what song did I hear the other day that I thought would be really, really cool that we would never be able to do? Um, it's the one that they all took a turn at singing. Uh there's a song, it's it's actually an outtake. It came out on Missing Links. And since Missing Links, they've released it with every single monkey singing it. What is it? Uh, I don't know. I'm hoping somebody out there is paying attention. Yeah. Anybody know this one? What? Come on. The, You'll win a free autograph from Rich Dart. You're give him something that's important and means something. Are you going <laughs> to autograph my CD for me when I see you? Sure. Um, I, I'll tell you, my favorite monkey song is Someday Man. <laughs> really? That's a great tune. The last, pr Prithy? It's not Prithy. That's a good choice, though. That was um, a good one, Mary. Uh, no, what is it? Where uh, are my monkey nerds at? Come on. Do, 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 uh, well, actually, I, I think, would love to hear Nesmith sing. Do you know me at all? That's it. Thank you, Sydney Warner. Sydney, you win a Rich Dart autograph at any show you're at that he's performing at. Yes, I'll sign anything. That's a really good song. That's a great song. That's one of those songs that you don't think of, you know? It's not like, but you're right. That's an amazing song. Yeah. Somebody asked Mickey to do Midnight Train. We've done Midnight Train in the past. I, I thought you did. Yeah, we did it on the 50th anniversary tour, him and Coco. You, you didn't, and I knew you did. Yeah. Oh, Ryu Shi. That's the done Ryu Shiu. But in fact, Ryu I got to sing on Ryu Shiu. Ryu Shiu? Oh, I remember it at the Christmas show. Yes. The big Christmas fiasco. Yes. I yes. said I they pulled me off and made me sing on that. Yeah. With your beautiful red hat with the feather. That's right. It was it was such a good look for you. And Davis Santa Claus. Yes, that's right. He got lost. That was a spinal tap moment on that show. So we did reissue several times, but on that specific show, was that in Philly? That was right out of Philly, that right? That was Bethlehem. Bethlehem. And 
Dave was supposed yeah. to come up the elevator and come through the crowd as we played Santa Claus is coming to town or here comes Santa Claus. And we're playing and we're playing and he's not coming because he had got off the elevator on the wrong floor and was <laughs> lost. <laughs> and then, so finally Wayne said, forget it. Ladies show and Mickey Dolan's. And that's when Dave walks through the crowd as Santa Claus and Mickey didn't know what was going on. So he's like, what am I supposed to go out? So it was great. Good times. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very excited to see you. At some point, it's going to happen, you know? It, it will. And it's not I'll a threat. Away. So um, everybody is um, being asked, I'm asking you, you have this other project that you do, Creamed Corn. Yes. It, and what are you guys doing? Because I want, I know that you're always sending me these really unique songs. <laughs> good way to describe them. Really yeah. unique. Well, they're they're different. Like I don't even know how. To, it's somewhere between like Weird Al and music, mm -hmm. and um, and, but they make me laugh and they're fun. Well, that's good. Well, that's what they were supposed to do. Um, now I have to tell you that uh, real quick. When I met Danny Bonaducci and you had asked me to get his autograph, yes, <laughs> to, to the what was it to the illegitimate sons of Keith Barge. Yeah. That's one of my other bands. Where the hell do you come up with these names? I made that up. It's a good thing the quarantines are already taken. <laughs> That's a great band name. <laughs> so um, everyone's going to go to Cream's Corn. They're yes. going, and I'm going to put the um, link on my page so Perfect. that people can like that. And then you're doing a project with them that people can look forward to, right? Right. Well, we, we started a project at the beginning of the year, which is a project I did a few years ago, where each month we were going to write and record a new song. It was your and goal. That was our goal. And uh, we got two of them down. And then COVID hit. And uh, unfortunately, not all of the members of the corn are 100% in the modern age. So we can't continue the recording process because uh, we all record at a, a studio at our friend's mm -hmm. house. Um, but that's going to pick up. So we started that. And then um, we decided we were going to do one of these online things where we each, where we play together. But those, what people don't get is those aren't done live. Those are done like the way the Stones yeah. did it on the thing. They, they each recorded their part and then they edited it together. So we did that um, over the course of the last week. And I'm editing that and that'll be up on the, on our corn page probably tomorrow or the next day i'll make sure that everybody checks that out i just want this quarantine to be over so that we don't have to watch videos like that anymore every one of these i mean it's great seeing the goonies reunion and every one of these reunions but it's missing something by not yeah. having that i agree back. i agree but i think we're handling it really well which is actually very cool um, I'm really proud. I'm I'm actually very proud of of everybody because I think I I would have expected more people to jump off the bridge by now. But yeah, you know, I guess when you really anybody that pays attention, it could be so much worse. So thankfully, everyone's doing what they have to do, and I know we're going to be back. I know that the guys, you know, I talk to Mickey all the time. I know he's, you know ready to go so yes we are all ready to go we are ready to go i would have been just getting home two days ago from the tour the <laughs> you know we can do we can start having mickey sticks we can um we can take your sticks and we can put duct tape around them so that they're they're poles six foot poles so <laughs> <laughs> keep everybody away there you go <laughs> rich you are so awesome Thank you so much. Um, this is the only way I get to talk to you because I know that you don't like to be seen with me. So this no, one. Don't feel bad. I don't like to be seen with anybody. <laughs> I, do, I do tend to take it personally, but then, you know, but then I'm sometimes he comes say hi to me and I'm like, oh, he knows I'm here. Yeah. Every once in a while, I, I decide to be nice. You are. You No, you really are. And you're so talented and everybody loves you. And, and you know, that's a lot of people don't realize, and I don't think that the band realizes that we don't all just go to see Mickey. It's that environment. It's the fun. You know, I remember when I used to think you guys were famous 
And I first was, I swear to God, I was given your phone numbers originally. And it was like, yeah, call me and whatever. And I was like, oh, oh my God, like I have a celebrity Rich Dort's phone number. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that'll, that'll get you nowhere. <laughs> like people are screaming at you they're cheering for you like you mean something to people well i, I appreciate that i you know i don't you believe. make people <laughs> you are part of the reason people leave their house and they go and have a good time like you're part of the reason for two hours somebody forgets about their problems because you and they see me and mine <laughs> <laughs> worst we just want to meet your boss afterward, you know? There you go. <laughs> Rich, get the hell out of the way. But yeah, exactly. the right day. Where's your boss? You are so wonderful. Just keep um, playing your music and keep making us happy because you really do. You make us all so happy. And and I know everybody loves you. I never heard anybody say anything bad about you. And You're Talking to the right people. I know. Well, you know, <laughs> I, I have a call with your wife later. Um but we all love you so much. And I really appreciate you hanging out with us because this is the best way that fans can see you, you know, and, and, and talk to you. And then maybe the other guys from the band will talk to me. See, I figure if you do, anybody will. Well, I'll, if you can get Wayne Avers to do this, uh, I'll, I will give you anything you want. <laughs> do you all hear that? Wayne's next. I know. I think Wayne just dread. He, well, I know Wayne used to dread when I was coming into a room, but he gets me now. Yeah. Now we're we but all of you we realize that, I, that I'm just like an, an, an excited, an excited human. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I appreciate what you do. I know we all appreciate what you do. You, you all in your own way. <laughs> in our own way. I mean, we don't want to actually come out and say thank you, but, you know, we appreciate what you do. You've never not told me where the green room is, so that's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> Yet. Yet. Oh, I can't wait to see you. Just continue doing absolutely nothing. Oh, and you also, real quick, you're teaching drum lessons. Yes, through Skype. Through Skype. So if somebody, no matter how old they are, like let's say they're 45 and always wanted to play the drums, they have sticks. Are you are you taking on at any level? Like what? Yes. What, really? Yeah, really. I love beginners. I love starting people off. Really? You know, I, I teach any level and I, I love working with older people. I love working with college kids. I I love working with all levels, but I absolutely love beginners because then I don't have to break them of any bad habits. <laughs> wow. All right. Good. So yeah. So if anybody wants lessons, they can contact me, send a personal message on my Facebook page, my Rich Dart Percussionist page, um, and we can set things up. You know what? I think that if anything, this is a good time for everybody to relearn stuff. You know, we all kind of... Um, got away from what what we could be doing and now it's like we're starting over again you know rebranding ourselves i agree oh i'm so glad all right good so you're teaching drums we've got cream corn and um you're going to be back on the road as soon as possible as soon as possible right now it's set for july so let's keep our fingers crossed did you want a monkey mask no are you sure positive <laughs> my wife made me a mask so i'm wearing that one it does it have a band on there no my, looks like i'm gonna rob the stagecoach mine says i hate this mask please don't oh, that's wear great. it that's great well i saw and this is not about being political but somebody did say if you want them to make you take your mask off put trump 2020 on there <laughs> I'm just saying, I thought it was a like great Larry idea. David when he wears the, the MAGA hat, so no one will sit next to him. Well, Josh, Josh went to a family thing, and they all hate Trump, so he borrowed somebody's Make America Great Again hat, and he sat down, and he was like, how you doing? <laughs> just to make them angry. Hey, if I go black on you, it's because I have 2% battery. I just I'm want leaving. Have a good one. Thank you so much. I miss you. I miss you. I miss you. Thank you so much for having me, Jody. We'll Love you, Rick. I'll see you soon. Bye, All sweet. Right. Bye bye.
So Wayne Avers, I'm coming after you. We'll see. So anyway, we're going to go. If you want to learn how to play the drums and listen, our kids have nothing to do. They aren't, they are a waste right now because they're going to be for the next six months home with us. It doesn't matter how old they are. If you, I hired Jerry Trimble to mentor Dylan. If you want to learn drums, I'm sure Dave Alexander will teach um, piano. I'm going to talk to the other guys in the band. Now's the time. If you never watched, if you never played an instrument, but you've always wanted to, there are people out there. You don't have to leave your house. You don't, I mean, I haven't worn pants in two months. You don't have to do anything, but have an open mind. So you're never too old. So, and also make sure you check out cream corn and I'm going to put the link up there. Rich is awesome. I, he's just the greatest. And I hope that you like the stories and thank you for hanging out with us tonight. And we'll see who's coming up this week. You guys are the best. Keep remaining safe and I'll see you when I see you. Bye.